So good evening and welcome to our fourth event in this semester's keynote lecture series. My name is Jens Kugele. As most of you know, I'm head of research coordination here and member of the executive board at our center GCSC. And I'm very much looking forward to our conversation tonight on yet another timely and important topic. That is the notion of truth and post-truth and questions of discursive construction. We are very thrilled to be able to welcome tonight's keynote speaker, Professor Johannes Angermüller from the Open University. Thank you very much again, Johannes, for accepting our invitation and for joining us tonight. I would like to also thank the members of our GCC Research, Research Area 8, Cultures of Knowledge, Research and Education, and especially Dr. Kendrit Simon Peters for initiating this event and for the cooperation in conceptualizing and organizing the event together. Last, but certainly not least, I would like to thank our senior research fellow, Dr. Doris bachmann medic who can unfortunately not only participate online today, but who was also involved in the conceptualization of tonight's event, and who has quite frequently taught um, Professor Angermüller's texts in her GCSE masterclass, Concepts in the Study of Culture. So as you can see, um, your work is... Uh, 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 part of your work, at least, is very well known amongst the doctoral candidates for generations already. And before Simon Peters is going to introduce our speaker to you, allow me to add, as always, just a brief note on the format of tonight's event. Directly after the lecture, we invite questions and comments from all of you in the audience. For those of you who are joining us online during the Q&A, if you would like to pose a question or make a comment, enter a plus in the chat and we'll be happy to add you to the list. However, if you prefer to, you may also just write your question or comment directly in the chat and we'll be happy to read it out. Tonight's event will be recorded. The recording, as always, however, is limited to the audio and video of our presenters. The pres um, recording does not include any Q&A session afterwards, and neither does it include any chat activity or any metadata regarding the participants of this session. Please join me in welcoming Professor Angermüller, as well as our colleague Simon Peters, who is going to briefly introduce our speaker to you. So, okay, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, formidable session. I'm very happy to um, greet Johannes Angermüller today here. Um, and uh, it's my very honor to introduce him to you. Um, Johannes Angermüller is... Uh, a part of my GCSC history since the first minute, actually, um, because I, I applied to the uh, pre-doc seminar in the GCSC, and like after I got accepted two weeks later, there was a DiscursNet uh, session here in, in uh, Gießen, and uh, I was part of the organizational team, and so actually the first time I was part of this whole doctoral thing, um, uh, Johannes Angermüller greeted me and, and gave me some Rally news, which I will now give back to you. <laughs> it's my very honor to do this. Um, um, so there's first circle closed. Um, then uh, when, uh, when, when I wrote my master's thesis, after I uh, got accepted to the pre-doc seminar, I wrote my master's thesis and I, uh, I theoretically uh, dwelled into topics that uh, Johannes Angermüller is uh, publishing about and, and he's, what he's an expert at. And I, I asked him one or the other question about <laughs> what I'm doing there. And he, he was very happily to, to, uh, very happy to, to, to answer this, that. And I was very happy to get some, some notes from such a renowned figure. Um, so when I finished my master's thesis and I applied to the GCSC doctoral program, um, I actually sent him my master's thesis and I asked for um, for a recommendation uh, because I needed one for <laughs> the application uh, and he gave it to me so um, yeah Johannes Angermüller is part of my history at the GCSC from the first minute until I'm standing here and so until that point that I got to the uh, master class of Doris Bachmann Medic I wasn't uh, aware of how Johannes Angermüller is still already integrated in this uh, whole Institute since years. Uh, so imagine my surprise when I saw that <laughs> there is a text from Johannes Angermüller that I read already four or five times and um, we were discussing that there and I was like, okay, I know this man. Actually, I would sit with him in a room 
right now, if I would be able to go to Valencia as I planned, <laughs> but there was Corona, so uh, but I switched from the one uh, online session to the other. And I asked Johannes, do you want to come to Gießen? And he was like, okay, yeah, great. <laughs> so yeah, that was uh, the, the story how, how this invitation uh, was prepared. Then we went to the, the, the official way to the research area and uh, it was clear that the, uh, the invitation of Johannes Agamela would be beneficial for everyone here in the GCSC. Um, so yeah, well, I'm very happy to, to greet you here. Um, Johannes Agamela is well renowned as an expert on discourse analysis. Um, he is probably the most central figure in um, inter, intercontinental, maybe, or international uh, communication on discourse analysis. He's an expert on French discourse analysis. Um, he brought French discourse analysis to the attention of international researchers. Um, he brought together uh, critical discourse analysis from America and French discourse analysis and uh, English discourse analysis and German discourse analysis. Um, together in, um, in several uh, articles he published with the most well-renowned uh, figures in discourse analysis. Um, he published on Russian, he published on Spanish, he published on French, he published on German. Uh, so he's a, big, a pretty big figure in, in discourse analysis. And um, so, yeah, I'm very happy to, to have you here today. And I'm, it's my very honor to be the one introducing you to this crowd. And I'm very Glad to hear now about this very striking topic of truth and post-truth, uh, which is something I'm very interested in and, and I'm also working on an article to the, that topic. And I know that uh, a good friend of mine, Tobias, is also working on this topic. So very happy to have you here and the stage is yours. Thank you for this very warm and touching introduction to, um, to this talk and this um, occasion to be here. I'm trying to think back um, to how we got in touch. I think it's been 20 years when I first saw Doris Bachmann Medic. Um, I think it was in Erlangen, um, <clears throat> where she was giving a talk about um, the, the cultural turns. And um, we've always kept in touch more or less loosely. Um, I think the last time uh, we met was in Gießen. Um, that was about 10 years ago, um, a long time ago. And um, I remember there was a kind of dark castle out there somewhere in, in the German heartlands around here. And um, <clears throat> we had um, one of these um, workshops where I gave a talk. And, um, and, um, and so it's a really great pleasure to be here, um, to, to be in touch with you and... Um, um, to be able to to see and 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 feel you after um, three years of a pandemic, which didn't allow us to um, to really um, interact um, um, in in a such a nice way, I um, I'm not a big fan of um, of online um, communication. I must say, I, I I love to study and say a few things as I will try to do in a few minutes, but um, I, I definitely prefer the human experience, and I'm very grateful um, that this is possible that you. That you've put this into place and um, that we can have um, a discussion about this here. Among the many things that have changed over the last few years, obviously um, discourse is also one of the spectacular changes. Um, think of what it was like before 2016. Um, I think we all had a much more quieter life, at least I, um, who had moved to the UK in 2013 and then um, uh, was welcomed by Brexit, uh, the Brexit referendum, just uh, a few years after. Um, there was Trump, and I don't need to, to talk about that at all. Um, so uh, we know uh, that um, discourse has been intense, full of all kinds of um, positive or negative energies, and, um, and this is an interesting, uh, of course, uh, development for discourse studies. Um, we're no need of new objects, we have them all, and uh, there's no need to justify our field. It's been uh, very much um, um, acknowledged by anybody. Um, I think back then, 20 years ago in Erlangen, when, um, when Doris uh, spoke, um, uh, discourse studies didn't yet really exist as a field that uh, people would talk about as something normal. It was something like, um, you need to be rational, right, to do that? So um, we had some kind of um, post-truth kind of conversation about uh, these things, and this has really changed a lot. And um, one of the things that have changed over the last few years is that 
uh, people speak back for some reason or in some ways. And um, and this is something I just came across a, a, a few days ago. Um, a talk by Liz Truss, who happened to be one of the um, many prime ministers in the UK who uh, came up through post-truth discourses and then disappeared for some inexplicable reason. Um, and um, in a talk in 2020, um, not long ago, she said the following. As a comprehensive school student in Leeds, she's from Leeds, in 1980, in the 1980s, I was struck by the lip service that was paid to equality by the city council. It's, of course, a Labour city council. Uh, while children from a disadvantaged uh, backgrounds were let down. While we, had, we were taught about racism and sexism, there was too little time spent making sure everyone could read and write. These ideas had their roots in postmodernist philosophy, pioneered by Foucault, that put societal power structures and labels ahead of individuals and their endeavors. In this school of thought, there's no space for evidence, as there's no objective view, truth and morality, are all relative. Now, this is um, very interesting, and you don't know whether you should feel flattered or um, intimidated uh, by, by these um, uh, receptions. Um, I mean, there's, there's worse reception, and of course the worse reception is then when these people use discourse analysis, which also happens. Um, I mean, at the, at the, that's what some people claim uh, from, from the rattle, rattle right um, I think Stephen Bannon um, dropped some reference to, to discourse analysis to, at, at some point and, and other these people. So um, obviously we are not, uh, we, we're in a bubble, uh, but we're not in a bubble which is totally kind of um, uh, close to the outside world. There's some sort of interaction and we become the object of discourses out there. Very powerful discourses which um, might be strange because one wonders whether she read Foucault, but which definitely make a difference. So if something like that happens, that definitely makes professors a bit um, ill at ease. I mean, because these people have um, all kinds of ways to make our lives miserable, uh, including money and all kinds of things. And that's what they do, by, by the way. Um, so um, I guess if Discourse Studies has had a good time because of post-truth discourses and these discourses uh, from populist leaders, um, we also need to recognize there's a new kind of challenge for discourse studies when there's this kind of interaction and we ourselves become um, the object of these discourses that we want to study. So what I want to suggest is um, to have a closer look as, at post-truth discourse as a challenge to uh, discourse studies and the way that we have gone about reflecting, criticizing, commenting on truth claims, the construction of power and reality and all that. And um, I want to take post-truth discourse as something that needs to uh, invite us to change some of the things and to rethink uh, some of the um, established um, um, uh, debates and um, arguments that we've been using. So what is post-truth discourse? Um, I would see a few points and um, it's probably um, not an extremely established term and um, I guess um, if, if some of these things come together we can speak of uh, uh, post-truth -truth discourse. The first thing is of course the use of uh, counterfactual claims um, but not only lying in an ordinary sense but systematic uh, repetitive lying so in order to create new realities and, um, and use these um, these strategies as a, as a weapon, uh, as a, a kind of a strategy in public discourse. Uh, with the idea to create um, outrage so that people um, speak back, the idea of course is to um, uh, create resonance um, that makes these people who use these kinds of arguments um, uh, important. Uh, it's, it's not all, only of course those who, who follow them who um, who are addressed here, but especially those um, who, who are against them. Um, in the longer run, this might lead to, um, uh, to um, a situation where all kinds of people start to, um, to claim expertise in certain areas, 
Um, you remember the discussion about uh, the COVID vaccines. Um, there's lots of other um, examples of um, discourses where people uh, from lay backgrounds um, challenge the authority of established experts. Um, and I don't want to um, judge this here. It's, it's, I mean, I try to um, give give a definition of uh, what is. Um, and then, of course, it might um, lead in the long run to um, to new quality or changed declined quality of public discourse, uh, especially when there's uh, no longer a sense of truth as a regulatory ideal, uh, when um, people no longer see the difference between um, uh, truth and, uh, and non-truth, and when the whole idea of truth uh, becomes questionable uh, for public debate. Um, now, this is, of course, something which... Um, um, it's not totally new um, to discourse uh, analysts and not not even to social scientists. Social scientists have dealt with um, public discourses for a very long time. It's a very normal thing for sociologists, political scientists, educationalists, um, even philosophers and, and all kinds of people um, to um, define their place in relation to discourses out there in society. We are all a part of society, so it's it's very artificial to create a distinction between us and them, and uh, we're also um, always citizens, so we can't be unaffected um, by these discourses out there in society. And uh, <clears throat> the problem, however, however for, uh, for, for discourse studies is, if we as discourse analysts think um, that discourse can be deconstructed as power knowledge, um, does populist post-truth discourse also do some sort of discourse analysis when they do just that? Um, some people have picked up on that problem, that relation between um, critique from an academic field of uh, societal discourses and the other way around. And um, there are all kinds of um, uh, reactions I won't go in. Uh, what I'd suggest is, I mean, this is definitely not a new problem for, for the social scientists because we're all part of society. And um, there have been two large reactions to this problem. One very... Uh, common reaction has been um, to say, well, we as social scientists, we are agnostics. Uh, we observe values and the negotiation of truth and values and all that out there in society. And we try to understand how this works. But there's no way um, that we as social scientists um, can justify the superiority of one value over another. Uh, we can observe how values are being discussed but we can't justify values. This is, of course, the very classical uh, point of view of Max Weber, um, who founded uh, sociology as a discipline, and it is a very um, uh, widespread idea uh, in the social sciences nowadays. The other response <coughs> has been to, um, um, to take an explicit um, value standpoint, um, a moralist, committed... Um, uh, point of view, uh, from where, for example, um, a certain um, point of view is adopted, like the oppressed minorities um, and their experiences, and then um, criticize uh, dominant discourses um, from that point of view. Um, this is something which we see nowadays, of course, very much in intersectional debates. Um, it's much stronger in the educational field and, um, and social work. And, uh, and also in linguistics, by the way. Um, linguists are usually much more closer to the educational field than to, 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 to sociologists. And, um, and so, um, of course, the, um, the populist reaction would be in both cases, okay, um, so you claim to be neutral. Um, that's what we're saying. All values, all realities are just equal. And there's no distinction between that anymore. Right? So we... We follow your, your reasoning totally. So that's the kind of um, problem of trust with so-called postmodernist science, which is not a problem of postmodern science. It's a problem of all science because um, this is definitely um, very fundamental for, for so many uh, empirical um, scientists. And to the moralist or committed scientist, um, the, the, the populist would say, okay, cool, 
yeah, but that's exactly what I'm doing. I take um, a certain value standpoint and, um, and I, I, I tell you that it's better than the rest and um, I don't care what the others uh, say and uh, the other values um, are not um, recognized. Um, of course, uh, both responses um, are wrong in many ways um, in that um, I don't think there's anybody in the scientific field who questions um, the ideal of the scientific truth, uh, a quest for truth. Uh, which is uh, certainly very much uh, at stake in in, in populist uh, uh, circles on 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 in in, in social media. And um, but the problem is how to deal with these different um, challenges. And I think um, uh, if you think like me that there's no fundamental uh, boundary line between science and society, uh, we definitely need to um, to um, to take up these uh, these uh, these problems. In discourse studies, um, this um, this division between two epistemological um, camps is, is replicated by the division between constructivism and realism. Um, I, I don't know, from what, what are your backgrounds? I guess the broad range of disciplines in the social sciences and humanities, is that right? Lots of humanities? Some social scientists as well? Yeah, okay. So um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have a problem with my voice a bit. Um, I I just got my 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 fourth uh, COVID shot, and um, it does some strange things with my body. <laughs> so I hope you can understand me. So in discourse studies, um, this a distinction between let's say a committed camp of of scientists and a relativist camp of scientists is is replicated by. The distinction between constructivism and realism, and the dividing line is quite um, harsh. Um, this, I mean, perception, but there's not too much inter-exchange between both. Constructivism, of course, has a um, a very strong uh, background in Germany, um, phenomenology, and um, there's um, uh, this uh, sociology of knowledge, which uh, has a construct a strong constructivist uh, epistemology. Well, basically, the idea is. People are involved in social discursive practices that create social realities. And um, the question is how to account for the um, constitution of reality in these social practices. Um, in that um, paradigm, of course, there's very little um, interest for power inequality. Um, and, and I guess um, most people, most colleagues from, from that area would also agree that um, there's not a sense that there's something like truth um, as an objective overarching reference. It is um, in the Weberian spirit of, um, of um, the conflict of values. I'm not saying this is wrong. Um, I'm just trying to account for, um, for these orientations. There's another uh, orientation which I call realism here, which is um, uh, not very strong in Germany, but um, there's a tradition of realist sociology in the UK, a, s a small one. Um, realism is very strong in discourse studies, um, believe it or not. Um, uh, in the UK, um, what you see normally as critical discourse analysis is um, a kind of realist idea of discourse where there's something out there, um, a block of social reality, of power, of matter, of whatever. Um, uh, there's a problem in discourse um, accounting for those realities. Um, there's manipulation, there's um, some misrepresentation. And the question is how to, um, how to get it right, in a way, <laughs> to be very blunt. So um, it's a very different idea of um, of, uh, of doing discourse studies, and um, and and you see that basically um, this is very much in the same line of the kind of relativist and um, the committed scientists, right? They um, they have these uh, two big strands of, of discourse studies, and I think um, both in a way have their limits, and we need to uh, think about how to go beyond them. Um, what I suggest in the following is a kind of middle way, um, because I don't think that um, discourse studies should be um, uh, left behind. And um, I think discourse studies has a very important contribution to these problems. Um, but um, I think the problem is that 
the constructivists usually basically um, imply that there's no difference between the different types of knowledge circulating. They're all powerful, and then they become true. Um, that's a kind of radical Foucauldian idea in a way. But there's no way um, to account for, for the difference of quality between different types of knowledge. And I think this is a problem. This is a problem if we want to, to talk to our populist friends. Um, and then we have the realist um, discourse uh, uh, studies people. And I think their problem, of course, is that um, they basically um, um, have a strong subjective involvement in um, the way that they uh, account for and reflect on other discourses. Um, that makes it difficult to, um, to distinguish between their subjective point of view and um, other subjective points of view, which are precisely uh, what feeds uh, contemporary post-truth discourses. Um, so um, I think post-realism uh, is not, I mean, even though, I mean, there are lots of people who spontaneously think, okay, now we've seen all that kind of postmodernist relativist crap, right? And I mean, of course Trump is wrong, right? So let's go put back to realism. I mean, this is a gut reaction that we can see. But I don't think that this, this is really um, um, the convincing uh, response because that means um, basically going back to something pre-Weber and, um, and giving up the idea that... Um, uh, that that uh, science, in a way, um, can mark um, a space of its own where um, where there are certain standards and uh, discussions which um, which can't be conf conflated uh, with uh, with uh, discourses out there in society. So um, I, I think that realism um, is is a trap in a way because um, at, at the end of the day, people will ask. But of course, I mean, if if you sell your idea of of reality. It's, it's your subjective point of view, right? So uh, at the end of the day, I don't think that realism is, is really um, the answer to the problem. So um, what I'd like to suggest is um, uh, the approach to discourse as a discursive positioning practice where people enter discourse in order to become visible uh, with the resources they find and uh, over time they build up their subjectivity profiles and um, and the idea, of course, is that uh, as they do that, some people become visible, whereas many others don't. And um, uh, a very fundamental um, observation that we can make, and it's very easy to do, um, is that whenever we deal with discourses, we um, we see there's huge hierarchy hierarchies of visibility, and um, this is not not very difficult um, to. Um, uh, to visualize. Um, here you find um, an analysis of uh, Twitter discourse from a few years ago. Um, it was, I think, around 2016, the Brexit referendum just took place. And um, they visualized the, I think, 500 most important Twitter um, uh, accounts in public debates um, around uh, contemporary public discourse. And uh, so what you can see here is that um, there are some players um, who do make a difference. Um, I won't go into um, the names here because it's um, too small. I mean, of course, I mean, there are lots of them. But there are just a few hundred who really make a difference in global uh, public discourses. It's not that anybody can enter as we thought um, in the early 2000s when we just discovered um, uh, internet, that it would be a huge new kind of... Um, uh, space of freedom where anybody can talk to anybody in, in totally free ways. This is definitely not the case in in the online uh, medium. And uh, what we can see here is that um, there's uh, just a few MPs in the UK. This is mainly UK discourse, right? There's just a few MP MPs who make a difference. There's just a few outlets. Um, there's just a few institutions with their Twitter grounds, uh, which... Um, which really make a difference, which are retweeted and um, and then um, can can say something of um, of relevance. So in order to have a closer look at these structures of visibility, and I think it's important to see that there's a, a great deal of structuredness in the way that um, subjects become visible. It's not that anybody is visible from the outset. Um, if we have a look at um, a breakdown of certain groups of 
um, online media um, accounts. Uh, we saw this, and this is, I think, from 2017. I think it was just after the election of Donald Trump. Um, and, of course, he is the king of um, Twitter. And if you have a look at um, at uh, the other Twitter accounts, you see um, Alexandra Ortega Cortes. I always forgot her name. Um, a, a very young Democratic um Congresswoman, who is a second, way ahead of uh, the big shots of her own party and the others. And, and so you see there's obviously um, in the last 10, 10 years a big rearrangement, a reshuffling of, um, of uh, political power through the visibility that is given to some of the successful social online media actors. And uh, the other interesting thing is you also see the... Um, 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 the news corporations and uh, um, the um, uh, newspapers, um, they, I, I don't think we can compare them in, in, in numbers here, but, um, but you also see that they're active on, online in, in Twitter. And uh, I'll, I'll get to that as well. Um, it was, of course, a huge surprise to see that Clinton lost against Trump and, and this explains why, why she, she did. Um, she was just totally squashed by, by this Twitter machine, right, uh, which is Donald Trump. And um, he got just so much more attention that whatever he said, it didn't, didn't matter. People listened to Trump. Nobody listened to Clinton. And this is how uh, people use elections nowadays. Uh, just a few words about uh, the structures of vis visibility, which don't stop with individuals, but we need to include the big uh, media corporations and uh, players here. The online um, controversies over post-truth and populism have also very much changed uh, the arrangement of power between different newspapers and, um, and news communication uh, corporations. Just remember that the New York Times was in financial difficulty just before Trump. And, um, and uh, the Washington Post was, I think, um, bought by somebody in order to be saved. And, and so um, they definitely um, um, benefited from those controversies. A lot of interest, especially from the democratic spectrum, went um, to those... Um, um, uh, journalistic um, 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 uh, corporations, uh, including CNN, uh, which became a kind of um, anti-Trump um, news channel in, in many ways. And um, I think Breitbart is a bit too too strong here. I, I'm not sure that uh, that was perhaps a, a very specific thing. Uh, but Fox News is definitely um, an, another kind of example of this um, new area of um, very quick, very high-intensity public discourse where visibility is concentrated among very, very few outlets and they exploit it. And um, this is how they they not only get established, but they survive. They have to, to follow this tendency, right? And, um, and I think one of the big challenges um, nowadays is that the uh, most of the visibility... Um, among the political actors goes to the very much right-wing actors, uh, various on, on, on left-leaning and um, liberal side. Visibility goes to newspapers and, and uh, TV um, networks. So you don't have the same type of um, anti-populist um, actor becoming visible through the online uh, medium for the time being. Um, as it has happened uh, with people like uh, Trump and Bolsonaro. And um, all that visibility in a way for the time being seems to be um, captured uh, by, by these um, companies. And that means uh, who, who, who can we still elect in order to, um, to balance the whole thing? Well, anyway, the point now is that, I mean, one thing is to look into these structures of visibility. When we can go on and on and we see lots of them, it's very important to see that these structures change very, very, very quickly. And it's not something static at all. And, um, and of course, I mean, in 2015, Trump in the political field was nobody. And then within a few 
uh, months, I mean, he dominated uh, the police scene. And this is because um, he entered a controversy, he entered many controversies, where he engaged other people who participated um, in order to become visible as subjects in that discourse, in that discursive space. And, um, and so um, I want to visualize discourse as a space where um, lots of different controversies take place uh, with their different speeds, backgrounds, histories. Um, most of the controversies, of course, we're not aware of because our brains are just too small. Our attention is not um, large enough to, to follow them all. Um, I, I took Trump um, because you all know it. Um, it's, it's very sad because, I mean, this is exactly how they work. I mean, they force you to, to pay attention and then um, that just adds to, to the problem in a way. But anyway, so, um, so Trump um, was very much able to exploit um, these, um, these, uh, these dynamics in, in discourse, which are very much about um, becoming visible and, uh, and turning visibility um, as a resource into something of political relevance, of economic relevance, and um, all kinds of different capitals in a way. And, um, and this is something that happens uh, through institutions. Institutions, in a way, have the tendency in many fields to, um, to pick some winners and make them official. Um, in the political field, of course, you have votes, elections, parliaments, governments, with all, all kinds of very important official positions. And so reputation that is gained in, in these free-floating public contro controversies um, can be converted into um, institutional power, which is something very different because um, there you follow certain rules. Um, it's about bureaucracies. It's, it's about um, very specific um, uh, procedures and all that. And, uh, and from there, of course, uh, people can, can, can get a hold of certain apparatuses of, of power and, 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 um, uh, and, and make an even bigger difference, again, in the free-floating controversies, right? So it's, it's, um, it's a thing that can uh, mutually um, reinforce each other. And so um, um, some, some parties uh, exploit that nowadays, of course, um, through social media. Um, it's always been, I think, uh, to, to some degree like that. We can find this, um, this kind of um, cooperation, let's say, between um, a free market of reputation, of, of, um, of um, profile making, um, and, and, and a state-dominated um, um, area of... of um, of uh, status positions, we can see that in many areas. Think of the the, the world of art. You have um, artists competing for for recognition, for reputation in in in, in the public art um, uh, discussion. And then there's some museums to to put them on 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 screen and on in 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 in, in these uh, respective places. Um, you find um, all kinds of cultural workers in in that kind of dynamic, right? Where um, the um, the creation of visibility is extremely important for people, and um, and, uh, and and politics definitely is uh, one of the important um, areas of, of that um, of that kind of uh, mechanism. Um, the point, of course, is that those people who get officialized with their official institutional position, um, they're the product of so many people uh, participating, contributing to public debates and controversies. They basically um, can trade in the public profile they gained in these very, very large uh, dynamics, sometimes involving millions of people, in the case of Trump, probably billions of people. Uh, they can trade on this public visibility in, in a, into an, an institutional position. And, um, and this is, of course, something that is easily forgotten. And this is how why this process sometimes is mythified a bit, as if, I mean, these are personal kind of um, um, talented um, actors <laughs> who have um, a special kind of um, um, charisma. No, no, it's, um, it's a product of, of millions of people. And, and they can gather and muster 
um, the um, discursive energy, the labor that so many people have been involved in uh, through their clicks, through their comments in the families or in social media, um, by buying uh, newspapers and um, being interested in all that, by giving time, right, to, to that kind of discourse. It is through all that energy that is given by so many people that these people get so much power. Visibility is not just an illusion, it's a very real social relationship. And, um, and it's important to understand that we are all part of it. It's not something that, that is just them, right? It's, it's, it's a very kind of um, um, collective um, mechanism. So in order to, um, to advance, and I wonder where we are because I don't see the time here, um, I will take one or two um, uh, examples of a particular controversy in order to, um, to think about um, these structures of visibility that emerge as many people do something in discourse and participate in one way or another. And, uh, and how we can account for the question of truth as, as, as a stake that is also, of course, important for discourse studies. And it should be. Um, and we should um, um, think about how these social structures of visibility and many others um, are articulated with the question of truth and the way that certain things make sense, reflect sound judgment or not, and um, whether there's a connection that can explain why um, there's an outburst of, um, of post-truth discourse or an outburst of truth discourse. Um, I um, picked here um, Trump's intervention in the debate about a cure of COVID-19. Um, I worked a bit on that, so I, that's why... I, I chose it. There are so many other examples. This is quite unusual, I find, um, because he cites um, an academic reference here. Um, I don't know whether he wrote the tweet. Uh, I mean, I guess he usually does. But, um, I mean, here we are. And, um, and so um, he, he says, well, I mean, according to some scientists, um, a new cure has been found. Can read and um, and um, and uh, those people in the FDA, I think that's the um, medicine agency for for the authorization of, of medicines and, and drugs. They should go ahead and um, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> one thing, of course, uh, what what at the time was very important is, I mean, the outrageousness of doing that. People were affected by that. I don't want to go into that. I think that's not the point here. I mean, we can, of course, say that it's not up to the president to participate in these debates, uh, which is very much about clinical tests and um, institutional experts on making decisions um, uh, with very much more background than, than he has. Um, it, it might be received and was received as bullying, uh, bullying the FDA into acceptance. Um, but anyway, uh, the point here, what I'd like to raise is, I mean, even though it's Trump, right? Um, at the point, I mean, what can we say about the truth value of these claims here? One thing is, of course, that um, today we're pretty certain that hydro hydroxychloroquine is not a cure of, um, of COVID. At that particular point in time, it wasn't quite clear. And... Um, and so um, it's something that, that happens all the time that we make predictions that turn out to be true or not. And I think that's, um, that's a very important thing about uh, the whole discourse about truth. We make claims about something and the question is whether they will stand the test of time. And, um, and some people have a better record in doing that than others for certain areas sometimes. And... And we, we also trust some people a bit more about doing that. Many people, of course, had no trust at all in his judgment and said right away, right, that this is not something that, that, uh, that, that can um, happen. And what happened with hydroxychloroquine is that it became a Trump drug uh, where people um, 
didn't talk about uh, any medical uh, uh, pharmaceutical um, questions, but it was just, are you for or against the Trump drug? And um, it, it worked. So uh, what definitely worked here, as always in Trump, is the mobilization of lots of people for or against. Um, it also made him very visible. I mean, you see um, more than 100,000 tweets here. And um, there's some questions about the truth value of this claim. And um, and as such, I think the claim is not that controversial as many others. And um, I think we can just keep it in mind here as um, as an example of the problem that we have in order to, to think about uh, the question how these social things hang together with the epistemic things, right? Let me get to a second example here, which is a bit different uh, than a particular claim. The interesting thing about the hydroxychloroquine uh, claim is, of course, that he made a claim that he knew and everybody knew that at some point in time, we would know whether it's true or not. So it's very risky. And that's why, by, by the way, most scientists wouldn't say anything, right? They, they would rather not say anything rather than make a claim that would turn out uh, to, be, to, to be wrong. And, um, and so maybe the really controversial thing by, by Trump was, how can he be so stupid to do that? Yeah, because, I mean, he became very visible in that moment and uh, mobilized his troops uh, very well. So, um, but he didn't really care about the epistemic um, dimension of the whole thing. So in this case, the Brexit referendum, um, the uh, uh, question is much more uh, complex, and this is much more typical for lots of discourses, because we're not talking about claims Individual claims about a truth, the truth or the untruth of a certain fact are very rare in discourse. I mean, you have some natural scientists, perhaps, who, who really process claims all the time. Um, we, we do that all also, right? But I think um, most of the discourses cannot really be pinned down to something. Is this going to be true or, uh, or, or false, right? Um, this is much, much more complex. It's a soup of... Um, all kinds of interrelated questions. It's about trust. It's about um, affect. It's about all that. And the Brexit referendum um, is a very good example for that because, I mean, of course, I mean, how can it be, how can Brexit be true or not? Um, let's have a look at the question in the referendum. I think that's where the whole problem really started. The question in the, re in the referendum in 2016 was the following. Should the United Kingdom remain a member of the European Union or leave the European Union? The responses were, first, remain a member of the European Union, and, and second, leave the European Union. And um, so people um, were perfectly free to choose between one of, 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 of the two. This, of course, uh, meant that by the structure of um, the referendum, um, a division uh, was imposed between one and the other crowd. Um, and um, the problem was uh, there was no idea at all, um, certainly not here in the ballot box, nor even in any way in discourse, what it would mean to, um, to, to leave the European Union. Nobody had a plan, um, certainly not the government. They, they, they thought they would win with, um, with remaining. And, and so um, <clears throat> this opened um, um, a, a big kind of... Um, um, spiral of all kinds of claims that could be made, right? Um, that could be loosely attached to this initial question. But basically, um, um, there was no clear line of responsibility, right? Between the many claims that could be made in public discourse in order to rationalize or, um, or reflect on, on this referendum. Um, and, um, and the particular question which people could really vote on. So I, um, I give you some of the uh, well-known claims that, um, that at the time many people said were wrong. Um, uh, that, of course, um, drove um, the um, leave vote uh, to some degree. A very famous uh, red bus here that was um, organized by the Vote Leave uh, campaign, which was headed by Boris Johnson, where... <clears throat> It, um, it says, we send the EU 350 million pounds a week, 
which um, is supposed to be the contribution to the EU budget. Let's fund our NHS instead, vote leave, let's take back control. So there are all kinds of statements with implicit promises and um, predictions that raise the truthfulness of these things. Um, it was immediately said that 350 million is a total um, fabrication. It was just 150 million net because uh, this is the gross number, which of course uh, makes no, no sense at all. Um, so um, the other prediction uh, is that if we re re um, uh, uh, retrieve our, our contributions to the European Union, which many people said would not be possible and wasn't quite possible because they continue to, to pay. Um, it would be very doubtful that um, an, an organism like the NHS, would, uh, the health service, would, uh, would benefit from it. And um, it's really strange that even under, under Johnson, who, 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 who became prime minister because of that, he didn't make any efforts to to uh, to say or kind of invent some money for for the NHS, so as to to justify the big kind of um, um, controversy that uh, that was very painful for many people. So, with the test of time, even that claim um, didn't materialize. Even though, I mean, they had um, um, uh, the resources and the power in place. There's other st uh, statements like Turkey. Um, uh, was supposed to be to, to, to join the EU at the time, which was wrong, um, and and um, there's a, a very interesting, and that's I think what what's what's most interesting for us here, a debate about the economic effects because it implies all kinds of economic expertise, and one of the things that all Brexiteers um, at the time said before and uh, two years until two years after the referendum was that the UK could could continue to have so-called access to the single market, um, which um, economists and political scientists explained to them wasn't possible. You can't have access to the single market. You're in the single market with all the rules which constitute the single market, or you're not in the market. Yeah, you can't um, open the door to the single market and stay outside while having access, right? That's not, not how it works. And they never understood that. And so there was um, a continuing um, um, controversy between um, all kinds of people from different backgrounds about the truthfulness of that uh, prediction. And, um, and so we see uh, all kinds of um, interdiscursive um, relationships that, um, that are opened up here. And uh, in the case of Brexit, and I think that's very typical for many discourses, this is all kind, kind of lumped together, right? So that people... Um, they basically they react by taking sides between two very simple uh, camps: yes, no, um, leave, remain, left, right, and uh, this is the only way how to deal with these extremely complex um, uh, discourses, which um, which of course raise um, the question of truth in all kinds of uh, very specific ways. So. Um, <clears throat> <coughs> Let me try to re recapitulate a bit um, and theorize what we said, because I'm, I'm a bit afraid that what I said is, is a bit too um, in the dans le vif du moment, in the kind of um, 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 heat of the moment, right, where people are engaged in these kind of political debates and get get very much um, uh, whipped up. Uh, what I think is important here, in order to to um, make sense of it is to distinguish between different ways of valuing discourse and different uh, hierarchies of value that are constructed and constituted as people participate in these controversies. And this is, I think, something that we can see in many discourses. In, um, in both cases, of course, we saw a very strong hierarchy of social visibility, uh, and I won't repeat that. But we also see um, a, hierarchy, a hierarchy of epistemic values, um, that are attached to certain claims. Um, at some point, uh, these claims, when there's a test of reality, truth, or whatever, um, they become true or untrue, or um, they're um, objects of um, discursive struggles of the truth right away. And um, as a result of that, um, 
in many in many uh, cases these um, these claims become true um, or wrong in the perception of um, of these uh, controversies. And and of course, I mean, as more and more claims are made and people follow these debates, um, um, they they make some um, they create some ideas about who is trustworthy as a claim maker. And um, and people will try to understand who are the people in in the controversy who they can trust, so that in in the cases where claims are made where it's not known for them yet, they can follow a certain line, right? So um, they will definitely evaluate discourses in terms of the truthfulness of um, what's happening, and they will try to to understand the truthfulness of a claim, but also more generally of those who make the claims. And um, and so it is not true to say, I guess, that um, that everything is the same. For all those people who participate in these discourses, there are very clear um, differences in terms of um, the truth quality of certain positions of discourse. And um, and this is a, a very very uh, central question of um, of all participants in many of those discourses. I'm not saying that um, discourses are always about truth. That's definitely not the case. Um, I'm pretty sure that different people have a very different sense of how important it is. I might be biased uh, I'm by my position as an academic. Um, I might be more interested as a sociologist in empirical kind of claims than others. Um, I understand that for many people, politics is um, infotainment, um, which is legitimate. I mean, I'm not saying that this doesn't happen. Um, but um, I'm not saying that everything is all the same. And, um, and there are certain positions out there in these um, spaces that bubble up over time, which coagulate in ways so that they become more kind of um, consolidated. And, uh, and at least some people understand that those areas are more kind of um, um, reliable, um, more kind of trustworthy, credible um, as, as a discourse. And um, this is, of course, um, our business as academics, as scientists, um, to to understand what are, I mean, acceptable papers. I mean, we do gatekeeping all the time. I mean, it's, it's very much, kind of, of course, of course, part of my work. But um, but at the same time, of course, um, um, uh, we understand that um, these social dynamics are always interlinked with these epistemic attributions of value. Right? It's not something that can be totally be uh, separate. Um, we understand that subject positions which have become extremely visible, making certain claims about the truth or untruth of something, have to be taken very seriously. They are real. They constitute a reality that we can't ignore if we take part in that discourse. So um, these social things definitely make a huge um, difference. But um, then, of course, I mean, the quality of claims that can come from those positions can be good or not so good, higher or lower. It's not all the same, and we all um, make our judgments about those kind of differences and hierarchies. It's not um, that anybody out there, I think, uh, would accept the idea that uh, everything is all the same. Now... Um, it might be a point where I could close my talk. However, um, I want to um, um, to uh, come back to to our role of academics before I do that. Before I close the talk, and ask how do the um, truth claims that are negotiated in public discourses, in public discourses like Brexit, about economic effects, um, about the COVID cure, about um, hydrox hydroxychloroquine. How do, the, do these um, um, public discourses intersect uh, with our academic ones? And this is, uh, I think, um, the big challenge for us um, as discourse uh, people uh, facing uh, post-truth discourses. And so my first answer is, um, let's have a look at what's happening in science. And what I need to say here um, is... The mechanisms are exactly the same. There's no difference. And um, 
if you have a look at um, how people um, make claims, establish their field, their, their expertise, it's very much about engaging in controversies, taking part in communities over time, in large communities, where lots of people um, give something, right, um, without being cited. Um, a few people are cited and they capture uh, the recognition from, from the whole field. Um, over time, some people will kind of move up in these hierarchies of reputation. They will be um, uh, appointed uh, uh, for, for positions in university. I mean, you have a first appointment um, here at, um, at Gießen, uh, probably a first appointment. Um, that will, of course, um, um, go on. Um, for some, it won't go on. And, um, and so there's this kind of intersection between um, the free-floating dynamics of the marketplace of ideas in academia, where um, a very important effect is that some people get recognition and become the ones that everybody talks about, or many people talk about, and lots of people participate who are never talked about, who are not cited once. Uh, I think 50% of all participants, according to a very old uh, study, which might be um, obsolete, um, uh, participate in academia without ever being cited, um, and that they're very important. So um, they make the whole system work because otherwise the people who, who do get uh, into the prestigious positions, they of course represent a field which is um, not made by themselves, but by everybody helping together through um, all kinds of debates about the truth and untruth of claims and um, the value of all kinds of ideas and uh, concepts and the way that certain fields are made and all that. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, um, academia is exactly the same discourse in terms of how visibility is co uh, constructed um, as, uh, as a resource for a small elite of, of people and the way that um, truth claims are processed and negotiated. It's... Um, I want to remind you of the extreme hierarchies of uh, citation academia here um, very, very quickly. Um, I, um, I find in my work on academics that 10% um, of current professors in academia, that is the most senior academics in academia, um, are cited more than all the other senior professors in their field. So even within the very senior group, um, the concentration of visibility is enormous. And they're, of course, way more cited um, than the non-senior people in academia who I can't really um, represent here because they're not um, recognized. Um, and, oh, there's uh, one thing missing, but let's, that's not important. Um, the point now is, of course, okay, uh, we had a look into discourse as um, a positioning practice which leads in many ways through controversies mobilizing many people over time to the concentration of visibility and also to hierarchies of value um, in terms of truth and um, judgment and, um, let's say, epistemic value. And um, we see the same kind of social epistemic concentration, um, distribution of, of value in, in scientific and um, and uh, non-scientific political uh, discourses. Does that mean that we are relativists? No, no, no. We can very much uh, recognize that this is a very kind of um, social processual construction of, um, of, um, of certain, um, uh, of the social order. And we can also see how, how, how truths are, um, 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 are constructed and, and uh, established over time. Um, truths who do not only depend on the people making them, um, they also depend on, on things happening in laboratories, on, um, on predictions that may or may not take place. Um, it's, it's not something that uh, people can just um, decide on by, by pure um, um, uh, interest and belief. And the point now is, of course, that... Um, this is, in a way, um, a position that uh, rejects the idea that all truths and, um, and social relationships are equal. Uh, but it does not accept the idea that all is the same and uh, it's all kind of anything goes where um, truth, untruth, what the, what the hell, I don't care, right? So um, 
Um, I would say it's, um, I don't know how to <laughs> um, give it a label. I didn't. So you, you can look for a label if you want. Um, um, the point is that um, we um, entered discourses um, where we shouldn't start from the idea that everything is equal. And that also includes um, the idea of, well, truth. I mean, I of course, I have difficulty using the word truth because it's so much loaded and it's, um, it's, it's obsolete in our discourses. But, um, but let's say um, all that area of um, uh, judgment, of reasoning, of deliberation um, that, that constitutes the quality, uh, the good quality or the bad quality of public debate. And that's something where uh, what people understand um, is not the same. And, um, and this is something that we can analyze as well. And I think we have a sense for that. Uh, we know that this is not all the same, as we know that not everybody has the same social um, position, status, and that some people are more equal than others. That's something that um, I think shouldn't be a big deal of um, controversy. And to um, to conclude my uh, my my talk here, which tries to integrate some of the work of the last uh, few years um, into uh, one paper about uh, the social and the epistemic value of, of discourse is um, we shouldn't allow um, to define critique as some, some, something that happens when somebody with extreme social power can just impose an agenda. This is not critique. This is manipulation. This is propaganda. Critique is when we can reclaim, when we can mobilize the epistemic value of discourse in order to um, decide and um, deliberate on the value of discourse. And that's a very, very different thing. And I think um, we don't have to be academics to see the difference between um, the two types of um, controversy that we can start. But we should be for in for, for controversy on behalf of, um, of the good epistemic values of the discourses we produce. So thank you very much. And um, I hope you have um, some thoughts on that. <laughs>